Well, good morning, Cross Life, and thank you for being here today. And uh, this has been a wonderful day already in the house of the Lord as we've worshiped and we've been able to pray over our faithful friends. Uh, again, Ron and Linda, uh, so appreciate you all being part of our church for such a long time. Um, just, uh, just been a blessing. Uh, and, and Ron, I love Ron because uh, it's kind of like John alluded to. We, we don't always agree with any things, but he comes to me not, uh, not like, Pastor, you got this wrong. No, he, he's like, he, he comes to me with humility. I, I love the humility you bring to uh, your faith and to your walk. And so I just, I, I did want to say that I appreciate that so much. And uh, we all know Linda just wants to share the good news with others. <laughs> uh, you're an inspiration, to be quite honest with you. So thank you, Linda. Ron, we, all blessings go out to you uh, as you go on your journey. And we pray for less stress in this. <laughs> uh, but again, welcome. We're so glad everybody's here today. We are indeed continuing in our sermon series, the Gospel of Luke, the whole journey. Jesus is here to seek and save the lost, and that's what he does best, right? Well, today our sermon is entitled, Jesus Mourns and Warns. You'll find us that we are at the end of chapter 13 of Gospel, the Luke of God, Gospels, the the Gospel of Luke, um, there starting in verse 31. So if you want to find your ways there, that'll be great. But before and as you find your ways there, let me ask you a question. Who all thinks honesty is a good thing? Pretty much hands up everywhere. Now let me ask you another question. What, what do you think about brutal honesty? I, want, I need to be brutally honest with you. You know what that means. It just means I mean to tell you something that... May find, you might not like, but you need to hear it because it's in your best interest. Do you, do you like being brutally honest? Not so many hands. Yeah, it, it's interesting. As I kind of search this on the on the internet, it, it, the quote that comes up the most about being brutally honest is this. It says, it says, sometimes those who are being brutally honest are not so much interested in honesty, but as they are in the brutality. <laughs> And if that is your motive in being honest, then yes, you have a problem. Uh, indeed, it is not necessarily a great thing. But on the other hand, here's another great quote about honesty. Honesty is more than not lying. It is truth-telling, truth-speaking, truth-living, truth-loving. And I think honesty is very, very important. In fact, Jesus, I believe, thought it would be important, and to be quite honest, there were times when Jesus was brutally honest. I think this is one of the times when Jesus does that. He comes to his people actually with a broken heart because he knows that few will actually listen to his warning. And so we pick up in the passage today. It'll be on the screen. Follow along in your Bibles Verse 31 begins like this. At that very hour, some Pharisees came to uh, and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, Go tell that fox. Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the following for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wing, and you were not willing. Behold, your house is forsaken. I tell you, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Pray with me. Father God, your words have echoed for centuries across almost all lands. These words that you spoke, Jesus, we have because of your holy scriptures because of your love for us. This interaction, this mourning and this phrase and this warning 
has been given to all generations. Father, as we go into this text, Father, let our hearts be open, let our spirits be welcoming to all you have for us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. And the church says, Amen. In this first section, verses 31 through 34, you see Jesus essentially mourns, and if you're filling in blanks, the chosen. He mourns his chosen. Let's look at the first three verses, verses 31 through 33 again. It says, In that very hour some Pharisees came to him, Jesus, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, Go tell that fox. <laughs> Behold, I cast out demons. I perform cures today and tomorrow. And on the third day I finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the following four. It cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. This is a continuing message, if you will, it, because it starts out, depending on your version, it might say, in that day or in that very hour, some versions will say, it's connected to what just took place. So I do need to go back and remind you what we learned last week, that Jesus was given a question, if you remember, uh, will few be saved? And Jesus was like, yep. Only a few will be saved. He, he, he said that so many of you will come to God in that day, in that time, and, 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 and expect God to recognize you, and He will not. He will say, I don't know you. Go away from me. And Jesus also tells them that the Gentiles, the Gentiles will actually be in heaven as well, and they'll be ahead of you. <laughs> they will be first. Need a little more info on that? You can catch it online. That's what just happened. That is what's connecting what we just read. The same scene, if you will. And the Pharisees in this scene tell Jesus that Herod is after them. Now, folks, do not be fooled that the Pharisees are trying to protect Jesus. <laughs> they are no friend of Jesus. Most likely, the only reason they have told Jesus that, the, that Herod is after him, if indeed he is, is because they're trying to get Jesus to move to Jerusalem. Because when Jesus gets to Jerusalem, the Sanhedrin the, will have authority over Jesus and will be able to do ultimately what they did. But Jesus is neither impressed or intimidated by the news about Herod. In fact, Jesus does one of his classic things and just says, Go tell that fox. <laughs> uh, I, I love that. Jesus is, you know, I know we're not supposed to call people names, but Jesus does do it uh, with good reason, though. He, he, you know, he, he's got reasons for why he does what he does, for sure. Uh, and, and we would use that same term today, the way it's meant, I think, in, in the Scriptures here. Uh, basically, it would mean that this person is cunning, okay? Uh, they, they, some of the, the, the theologians dug into this word or this usage of this word that to say that if somebody was called a fox in Jesus' day, that would be saying that they were insignificant and worthless. And if you knew anything about Herod, that was pretty much him. Remember, he killed John the Baptist, and he was just a terrible guy. But it was a term of utter contempt, if you will. And so Jesus goes on and says, I don't care about what Herod is saying. He does care about this. As behold, I cast out demons, perform cures today and tomorrow, the third day. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today, tomorrow, and the following. For it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. So as for Herod here, Jesus is clear basically saying, I am on his mission. Uh, I, I, I am on my father's mission. I'm on my father's time schedule. And that whole idea, that you hear it twice in this, in this passage about today and tomorrow and the next day, uh, to be quite honest, I don't think we're supposed to take that so literally. Basically, he's saying, I don't care because I'm doing my father's work and I'm doing it in his timing. Perfect timing, by the way. 
I want to go down, if I may, just a rabbit trail for just a moment. Um, If I read the Gospels, I often think about this time period in Jesus' life because way back, I think, in verse or chapter 10 of Luke, he basically said he's made, start making his way to Jerusalem. He's taken a long time. There's all kinds of things that go on. It seems like he should have gotten there early, at least in my mind. But I think I understand this a little bit more now because he was in the Father's timing. Uh, let me share a prophecy that you may or may not know about. It goes back to the book of Daniel in chapter 9. You've probably heard about it, the, the prophecy of the 70 weeks, okay? Daniel chapter 9. And if you take, it's not weeks in, in the way we think of weeks, it's weeks of years is the way most interpreters have go, taken that. And when you do that, you come up with an interesting number. 173,880 days is what that would be. Now, if you go into the Bible, also you find out there was a time when Israel was in captivity and they were getting released from this captivity by King Artaxerxes. He gave an edict to rebuild Jerusalem. They believe that edict came out on March 14th, four, the year 445 B.C. And if you take that number of the 70 weeks, the seven, or 173,880 days, and you move that forward, that apparently lands you, according to some theologians, to about A.D. 32, April 2nd. Now, I'll be honest with you, I don't know how they figured that out, and I'm a little leery about pinpointing a date, but it might be right. And, and it actually lands on the time of the date of the, the Passover lambs being brought into Jerusalem to be sacrificed for the Passover. It also relates to the time when Jesus most likely came into Jerusalem on a donkey and being worshipped as king. To be quite honest with you, the prophecy is close enough for me to say, wow, at least. (laughs) And understand that God does have a perfect timetable. He has a perfect timetable even when we don't think so. And that's what Jesus is saying to the Pharisees. I'm on my Father's timetable. And the question that I would ask you today is this, how about you? Are you on the Father's timetable? Are you in tune with God where you are trusting Him with your schedule on the way things come your way, understanding that God is in complete control? Are you willing to trust God with what He brings into your life? Sometimes it's small things, like what happened to me on Saturday. Because of the holiday, I was working on Saturday, and and I wanted to get a a good early start and get some things done, and I had some things shipped to my house that I were going to be bringing up here to, uh, to have some guys install some stuff, and I could not find that package. I looked everywhere. I drove up here. I drove back to my house. I drove back up here. I lost like an hour, an hour and a half of time because these guys wanted to get this stuff done. I wanted to have them get it done. And that was not on my timetable. Now, I could have gotten mad. But I have learned in my elder years now, you know what? When God does this and throws off my time schedule, he must have a purpose. (laughs) It is. It is. It's His purpose. And so I could get mad about it. I could get angry. I could be upset. Or I could say, all right, well, God had me do this, and I'm going to dig into His Word now and start, start digging in. But that's, those are kind of easy things. What, what about the hard things that come our way? What about some of the hurts that come our way, the devastations that come our way, the, the circumstances that move into our life that disrupt everything we, we, we have thought out and thought we would do. Are we willing to say, God's still in control? Are we in the midst of those hardest things able to say, Lord, my hope is in you? Can we sing that song to Him in those times? That, if we can, that tells us that we are 
willing to fall under, like Jesus, the Father's timetable. In verse 33, Jesus hints essentially why he's going to Jerusalem. He says this phrase, he says, For it can be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. Could it be that what he's basically saying is that prophets perish? Not just in Jerusalem, though. I mean, we know that all the prophets weren't killed in Jerusalem. John the Baptist just happened to be killed in, in Herod's district. So that wasn't necessarily Jerusalem, if you will. But Jesus is making a reference to Jerusalem, and, and, and it's most likely that, that the prophets aren't killed necessarily in Jerusalem proper necessarily, but they are killed not by their enemies, but by the Jewish people themselves. Because Jerusalem was the epicenter of the Jewish people. And so it goes to reason that what Jesus is saying is, you Jewish people, you God's chosen people, you have a history of killing your own prophets. So the Pharisees were trying to move Jesus along. And Jesus would not be rushed Jesus was on the Father's timetable. Amen? Jesus' response to this fake warning is to mourn the people whom he just addressed. He mourns them, and then he warns them again. So the next words in, in, in Luke's gospel here is a phrase that Jesus says here and says, O oh, Jerusalem, O oh, Jerusalem, verse 34, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to him, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers its brood under her wings? And then he says, and you were not Willing. Underline that in your Bible. Highlight that in your Bible. That is a key phrase. He says Jerusalem twice. This, is, this is, would be a term of endearment, really, because they are God's chosen people. The Jews are God's chosen people. Folks, we see this is going on today, what's going on in Jerusalem. It's because God chose those people. He loves everybody, but he did work through these people to bring salvation to the world. So ever since the time of David, the city of Jerusalem was indeed the center of worship, and God's people have over the years rejected the prophets, the very prophets that were sent to draw them back to him, they rejected and Jesus then paints this picture that's painted elsewhere in Scripture, and we'll look at it, but this beautiful picture of hens and, and chicks. Here you go. It should be on the screen there. Yeah, isn't that, isn't that loving? Isn't that caring? Oh, yeah, say it. Go, oh. Yeah. It, it is a beautiful metaphor, a tender picture of comfort and protection. It's used, like I said, multiple times in Scripture. Let's just look at three places. There's more. There's others for sure. I love in Deuteronomy 32, 11, it says, And like an eagle that stirs up its nest, it flutters over its young, spreading out its wings, catching them, bearing them on its pinions. What a beautiful picture. Kind of getting the hens to fly, but, or the chicks to fly, and, and, and carrying them when needed. Psalm 37, or 36, verse 7, How precious is your steadfast love, O God! The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. Protection, refuge. Let me dwell in that, your tent forever. Let me take refuge under the shelter of your wings. Folks, being under the wings of God, the, the protection of God is a beautiful thing. Without it, folks, we are in danger. The next phrase is the one, essentially, that breaks the heart of Jesus. Because it says, and you were not willing. The little chicks were not willing. They just ran off and did their own thing, forsaking the very protection that God had given them. 
this statement is of the past. Israel has been doing it for years, running away. It is prophetic for the moment, that very moment. They were, they were, Jesus was there. He was trying to call in his people, his very own people, and they refused it. It is prophetic for the future because this still goes on, not just for the Jewish people, but for the Gentiles, all people. They're either going to come under the protective wings of salvation of God or not. And once again, this would happen. God's chosen people would refuse. They would refuse the protecting, loving wings of the very Messiah was sent, not just the prophet, but the very Messiah. I think about that. What about our own nation today? Is our own nation, the United States, willing to go under the protective wings of God? There was a time. We have historical evidence, writings of folks like Abraham Lincoln and George Washington and, and others of our forefathers that go before that, that, that trusted God, trusted in Christ, believed that God was ultimately in control, knew right from wrong. But things have changed, changed rapidly just in the past 20 years. God has been pushed out, we know, of the schools and, and society and every place that we can see, it seems like. Yeah, there's times when he, when, he, when he does show up, when some sports figure says, hey, it was only because of Jesus Christ that I'm here today and scored a touchdown. And that's great. But so much of society has pushed God out. And they have made bad good, and they have made good bad. Do you think God will judge this country? Mm. Billy Graham was actually asked this question. <laughs> his, his answer is very interesting. He goes, if God doesn't, he owes Sodom and Gomorrah an apology. Wow. God gives us over, folks. He gives us over to our own sin. Romans chapter 1. We're in a day like that. But I want you also to remember very clearly, in Scripture, there is a remnant. There's always a remnant. There's always a group of people that stay close to God, that still can trust God in, those, in these very trying times. Folks, be the remnant. <laughs> be that. It's not easy. It can be lonely. But be the remnant. But I want to make this personal for just a moment, this idea of being under the wings of our God. Maybe you have been under the wings for a while and you have fluttered away. Sometimes we do that. Sometimes maybe the only reason you're here or online or hearing this message is because someone has pushed you back towards being under the wings of God. He's brought you, baby, back to church back to hear that He does love you. Maybe you were hurt in church. Plenty of that goes on, right? But God is saying, I don't want you to live out your faith alone. Be in the body of Christ. That's where you're going to find protection, actually, where you're going to find, uh, find purpose and where you're going to find love and restoration. He doesn't want you to be alone. Or will you come to Him? Maybe you've never had the protection of Christ. You've never been under His wings. He's calling you to come for forgiveness of sin and to be reconciled to your Creator. He wants you under His wings. Folks, don't be... Don't be that stubborn patient. Some of you might be that stubborn patient, but, but think about it this way. If, if you're sick with cancer and the doctor comes to you and says, hey, we have a cure for your cancer. In fact, 
It's been tested, and it's safe. You will, you will thrive again. It would be foolish not to take it. But so many stubborn patients don't. Don't be the stubborn patient that doesn't take the medicine that God offers, which is Christ Jesus. Because Jesus' heart is broken, folks, if you say, I'm not willing. I'm not willing. He mourns your refusal as he does here for those Jewish people that refuse him. But then he warns them. In fact, he's brutally honest about this warning. Verse 35, Jesus warns the unwilling. He says, behold, your house is forsaken. I tell you, you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Israel, the house of the Lord, God's people, in their rejection of God's loving Messiah, they will be forsaken. He already told them, when they come before God, he's, God's going to say, I do not know you. Go away from me to a place where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. God says, you will be forsaken. Folks, that's a strong word. It's a strong and brutal warning, to be quite honest with you. It means rejection. It means abandonment. It means desertion. Deserted. And to be honest, what happens about 35 years later Jerusalem is indeed forsaken. This does come to fruition. Between AD 68 and AD 70, the Romans essentially obliterate Jerusalem. I didn't understand this until I read this passage or this, this, this historical piece. Uh, but they, they basically submitted or, or starved the city into submission. According to the Jewish historian Josephus, he writes, the roofs were thronged with famished women with babies in their arms, and the alleys were filled with corpses of the elderly. Children and young people swollen from starvation roamed like phantoms through the marketplaces and collapsed wherever their doom overtook them. They were no, there was no lamenting or wailing because famine had struggled their emotions or strangled their emotions. Jerusalem will not bury all their bodies. So they were flung over the wall. The silence was broken only by the laughter of the robbers stripping the bodies. That's what happened to Israel. God's judgments are real. Now, this next phrase is also very interesting because Jesus quotes a psalm. Psalm 118, verse 26, and it goes like this. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And it goes on to say some more. Blessed is you from whom the house of the Lord. The quote is shown again in Luke's gospel in chapter 19. And it, it is attached to the triumphal entry. We'll see it again when Jesus triumphantly enters into Jerusalem. What's interesting is Matthew's gospel doesn't place it there. It places it after the triumphal entry. Well after, actually. And in that context, you know that that use of that psalm and that phrase is a stern warning. And I believe it's a stern warning here as well. With the beginning of that phrase basically saying, behold, your house is forsaken, okay? That, that sounds like a warning. And then he says, I would tell you, I will not see me until you say, and then it goes into the psalm. What's interesting is the blessed aspect of that psalm, if you understand that psalm, the blessed is not the, the recipients of, of God's blessing, it is actually the Messiah. <laughs> blessed is the Messiah, okay? So it's not us. So again, that would, that would lead me to say this is a, a stern warning that Jesus is giving to us. I believe what Jesus is actually telling us here is 
What he is actually saying, you will be forsaken until you recognize me as Lord. You will be forsaken until you recognize me as Lord. You will not see Jesus until you see him as he truly is. We see Jesus in, in, in this. And I say, the way, reason I say this is because we do see Jesus. We see Jesus come into the triumphal entry, He's seen by many people. He's seen on the cross, a spectacle by thousands of people. He's seen then, but that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about later. He's talking about when you see me when I come. When the Bible says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. When he comes in his glory in the book of Revelation, when it tells us that he, on his robe and on his thighs are written the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I believe that's what he's talking about. That's exactly what Paul says in, in Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. He says, So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. Amen? That's what he's talking about when you see him in his glory. And here's what I think the main point that Jesus really wants us to take away with today is this. It, it, it breaks the heart of Jesus when we don't see him as the perfect Savior he truly is. When we don't see him as the perfect Savior as he truly is. That's, and it's not only seeing him, I think. I think it's, it's treating him <laughs> as the perfect Savior. As Christians, we need to treat him as our perfect Savior. For the Jews specifically, this was a result of their not being willing. I know you don't love me as your Savior. I've come and I've healed you, I've protected you, I've comforted you, and you refuse me. He says to the Jews. And if you don't see Jesus as Savior in your life, they will see him in the next life at the great white throne judgment, where it says there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Folks, this is a brutally honest warning, but it's given out of love. It is given out of the most gracious love that Jesus could give. Now, here's an application for us, and I think this is as, as simple as I can make it. And it goes like this. The Lord is seeking you. Do not refuse him. Come to him. Let him comfort and protect you. And let him save you if you still need to be saved. This saving can be the saving of eternal life. The saving of your soul. It might be a saving of a crisis that you're in. where God shows up and you trust in his perfect timing. This is truly an amazing blessing. And what I want us to do today is I want this to, these thoughts that I've hopefully provoked in your heart and your mind to lead us to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. I, I, I believe God intended us to have a perpetual spirit of thanksgiving. Now, we, we just all celebrated Thanksgiving, right? Everybody here celebrated Thanksgiving. They had some turkey, most likely. You know, you got together with some friends or family or whatever. They, they celebrated and overate and had a good time. And that's, that, The overeating is not what I'm saying that once God wants us to perpetually do. What I am saying, though, is the thanksgiving that was our focus last week. He wants that to perpetually stay with us. I truly believe that he wants us to maintain this spirit of thanksgiving, and I believe that's one of the reasons 
why he gave us this celebration of the Lord's Supper. You see, both in Luke's gospel and the writings uh, uh, the Apostle Paul gave to the church in Corinth about the Last Supper, both of those two men include the phrase, do this in remembrance of me. Why remember? Why celebrate? Why do this celebration of remembrance? Because of thankfulness. <laughs> you see, you can only be grateful for things that you remember. <laughs> if you don't remember, you're not going to be grateful about it. And so God calls us to, uh, to celebrate as a church this wonderful gift of remembrance of what Christ did. When we take time to reflect on what Jesus did on the cross, his blood sacrifice being the perfect and sinless Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, who has mercy on us, then we can fill our hearts, folks, with thanksgiving. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul writes this. He says, the cup of blessings that we bless is not a participate is it not it's again a rhetorical kind of statement here he goes is it not a participation in the blood of christ okay isn't that what we're doing participating in the blood of Christ? the bread that we break is it not a participation in the body of christ or are, are we not supposed to be melted into what actually happened it's actually, the NIV actually translate the cups of blessing. He says, they translate it as the cup of thanksgiving. I don't think they're too far off in that translation either. This celebration should infuse us with a perpetual heart of thanksgiving towards God. That's why we do it. The bread or wine, uh, the juice we use are tools that God gives us to, to, or for us to experience in all our senses our taste, our smell, our touch, our sight, so that we remember what Jesus did on the cross. Now, I know it's, a, it's, it's more of a Catholic term, but the word Eucharist, even most of you have heard that term, it's the, it is the embodiment of the blood, blood of Christ, the bread and the wine together is the embodiment of Christ and the presence of Christ in the elements. Uh, essentially is what that word stands for in, in Catholic understanding, but I think it's, a, it's also a beautiful term. I just learned this, that it actually, the word in the Greek means thanksgiving. <laughs> Eucharist actually means thanksgiving. And so we take that understanding into what we do today. Today, I want us to do the elements a little bit differently than we normally do. Today, I'm going to ask you to come forward so if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, I'm going to ask you to come and grab the elements and take them back to your seat. You will take them on your own. We won't take them together, but you will take them on your own. I'll start this time with a reading from 1 Corinthians. But what I want you to do as you, as you, come, up, as you come up to get the elements today, and I know people sometimes come and they fold their hands and they pray and that's fine. But I want you to look at the cross. I want you to take some time to look at the cross and remember that it was his body and his blood that was shed for our sins. I want us to remember what that was and the love that comes that way. Let me read the passage Pastor John will come up and open the elements, then you come as the Lord leads you, and letting God's Word and what we've heard today just influence your prayers. So in chapter 11, the Apostle Paul writes to the Corinthian church, for as, as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. For whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. He says, let a person examine himself and then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. 
For anyone who eats of the bread without discerning, the body eats and drinks judgment upon himself. Father, we come humbly before you, recognizing that your love is an everlasting love. Your faithfulness endures forever. You come to us with a steadfast love, a love that left the glories of heaven and came to earth, a love that walked among us perfect and sinless, a love that taught, that gathered, tried to gather its people under its, his wings. Father, you have called us, you have gathered, gathered us, that we, we might be your children. We can be under your wings because our sins have been forgiven. The penalty of our sin has been paid for through the offering of your son. There has been no greater love than this, than God to send his son who loved the world and who has died for our sins. Lord, we pray that this, this will never leave our hearts, that it will infuse us with thanksgiving that is perpetual in our life. And Father, we know in our weaknesses that we will forget, that we will forsake. But continue, Lord, to draw us back as a mother hand draws back and calls her flock to be under her protective wing. Lord, let us always go where you are. Let us always remember the beautiful sacrifice, the body and the blood of Christ. We pray this, we ask this in the precious, precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus and the church says, Amen.